Hello. I think we're live. Uh, please uh, give us some reactions in the comments if you're seeing us right now. Am I coming through? Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Psychedelic Liberty Summit. For those of you uh, who haven't um, met me yet, uh, my name is Mike Margulies. And today, um, for this session, I'm, I'm really honored to, um, to moderate uh, for uh, what I think is one of the more important projects in the community right now. Uh, it's the RN project and very specifically within the RN project, the, the North Star project. Um, and, uh, and Kat and Liana are going to go into that uh, in depth. Uh, they're both very good friends and they both are doing really amazing work here. Uh, so very uh, excited and honored to, to be a part of this. Uh, so Kat Konauer is a therapist. She's working with uh, SAGE, both the SAGE Integrative Health and SAGE Institute, which is working to provide access uh, to psychedelic therapy uh, for people who normally do not get access. Uh, and Liana is development officer for MAPS, uh, also has a deep history in the cannabis movement with Arcview Group, which she previously shared. And so the two of them are coming with uh, all of their various experience events together. Uh, they are two of the five co-founders of the RN Project. Uh, the other uh, RN Project team members, I believe, are actually here watching and probably in the chat. So you can also engage with the broader RN team as uh, Oren, sorry, uh, <laughs> the Oren team uh, in this chat. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn things over to Kat and Liana to share all about North Star. Hmm. Thank you so much, Mike. And just want to start here by calling in our other team members here, Sherelle Noble, our Chief Operating Officer, and Dave McGahey, author of We Will Call It Paula, and uh, another co-founder of Orn Project and our creative director, and Tim Chang, um, also co-founder and partner at Mayfield Investment, um, and our wonderful volunteer, Amy Serene. Um, and on top of that, the vast number, literally hundreds of people that we've been in conversation with, particularly over the past six, seven months, but well beyond that, that have inspired and informed our work. And to start this out by saying that um, our, our deepest hope here is to speak to our collective longings and hopes and fears and coalesce those in a way that anchors us in shared values and a commitment to integrity as we look at this Cambrian expansion in the psychedelic movement that is going to see um, is going to see the commercialization commercialization of psychedelic medicines uh, into a, a capital a capital system and that we have an an important opportunity to leverage our power, our collective voice, vision and values to shape what this looks like. And from there, I'd like to turn it over to Liana Galuli to intro. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kat. Thank you so much to Chakruna and to Bia and to all the helping hands and to Renee, who's supporting on the tech for this panel, and to Josh Meadows and just all of the immense amount of community effort that's gone into creating the space for us to gather here today and the platform for us to bring this, this project, which has really been a prayer that our team has been holding now. Um, we've been working together now for seven months on this vision, and it's just an immense honor to be a vessel for this project to come through and to be delivering it in this way to our community, our extensive and extended community. And I just wanna recognize I'm going to be using that word community a lot today. Um, and before I introduce myself deeper, I, I wanna name that we are referencing the legacy psychedelic community. So these are the people, the giants whose shoulders we stand upon, the people who are currently professionals within the field. These are the researchers, the therapists, the scientists, and the many helping hands that are holding this work currently. And in addition, I wanna also uh, reference community as the newcomers. The people who are inspired, who've had their lives changed, who might be new to psychedelics in the past year or two, and who are actively seeking to engage with and participate uh, as members of the psychedelic community. Um, this psychedelic community is uh, something I've been a part of now for the past 10 years of my life. 
and it's just been deeply meaningful for, for me. And I want to share that my background, I currently work as a development officer for MAPS. Um, I did work for the largest investor network in the cannabis industry, and there was a lot of very hard lessons that were learned in that process. And my deeper background is um, is one of an activist. I ran the Boston Anti-War Coalition for four years. I um, was a point person for the Occupy movement and helped start the occupation in Los Angeles. And I've been very engaged and have that, that heart and the spirit of an activist and the drive to want to change and shift the world. And since my time at Occupy, I've, I've had a really deep curiosity and hunger to understand the way that power works and the way that resources move through systems, and also to understand that resources and a great deal and a great amount of resources are needed to not only accomplish our goals in the drug policy reform movement, but also to accomplish our goals in bringing forward psychedelic healing into the world and integrating it, it into our society. Mm-hmm. With that, now if I can jump in, um, just looking at the the title, how can we create ethical and equitable psychedelic models for business? What we're really starting with here is intention, is values, is this question of how do we center integrity in solidarity and build a, a cohesive voice and strategy to do that work. So. Um, while there's an opportunity to dive into alternative economic models for business, which if you're curious about that, one, stay tuned to the work that will come, but you can also check out uh, our MAPS Bulletin article that goes into some of those, those other opportunities. But that today we're really here to launch the North Star Ethics Pledge and introduce to a, a broader audience um, and hopefully participants, um, what we've been up to at North Star and what we aspire to. Um, and while we've been involved in a very intensive, inclusive stakeholder process over the last six months, it is imperfect, it is insufficient, and it is ongoing. And so this is our chance to present to you for feedback, for accountability, um, and, and hopefully to garner your support to join us in this mission to center integrity in the psychedelic movement as it scales. So now, and our our, um, lovely team members will share with you in the chat, we have actually a deck if you'd like to follow along. We won't be going through it, um, you know, slide for slide, but we'll give you a chance to orient in our work um, and have a visual guidance because I know this format can be a a bit challenging (laughs) at times. Um, And in addition, uh, a link to the Ethics Pledge, so you can actually scroll through, check it out if you haven't seen it yet. You're welcome to sign if you feel inspired right now, and or really over the next chunk of time that we have together, um, to really engage us around the pledge, around our process, input here what your hopes and fears are, what your visions and ideas are, um, your concerns, your questions, and it can be you know, specific to the process that we've under, undergone, who we are and why the hell are we up here taking the stage on behalf of the community to raise this issue um, and concerns you may have about that, as well as the specifics of the pledge. How did we get there? What's the wording of this? What would you like to see different? What do you feel excited about it? So really just want to welcome all of your participation here. Liana. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll, I'll like to take this moment now to really focus on the why. And I think for many of us, the why is extremely obvious. There's been an ongoing dialogue for the past, I mean, two years solid now in the field as we see the success in the research. We see the success in the decrim movements with decrim nature and these initiatives that are being proposed in California and in Oregon. And there's a lot of questions around what we should do and what it will look like. And um, and there's also just a lot of new interest, right? You have, with, with such positive press and positive PR that we've been receiving as a movement and as these, you know, as, with the success, especially of the MAPS trials, I must name, there's a huge amount of newcomers who are coming in who have had profound personal healing experiences and who, who have unique skill sets and unique backgrounds. 
And one thing that I learned in cannabis is that it, the, the, the industry really changed when people who had expertise in, in operations, who had expertise in, in team management, who had these sort of skill sets that weren't normally acquired in, um, in, you know, a cannabis grow operation per se, um, were able to step in and were able to professionalize the, the industry. And I think there was a lot of benefits that came through in that time. And so I, for one, um, while, while people are coming in with a lot of passion, it's almost like a calling. Many of us feel that doing this work is a calling, much in the same way that somebody is called into the priesthood, right? There's some divine source of information that's come through that says, yes, I, I must and I want and I care to dedicate my life to this mission and to this movement. And I think that that's beautiful. And I also think that there's um, a lot of naivete, that there's a lot of people who do not know what they do not know. And that people who might have had success in business operating under a certain model or practice might come thinking that the thing to do is to apply the models that they already know how to use to this emergent industry and field. And I get why that's, you know, why that's happening. And for us, there's another thing that I want to recognize, which is that many of the people that are being approached by people who are entrepreneurs or investors and wanting to engage, they are the, the current experts of the field. And these experts are not, are, are conversely not so well versed in business. And so we have this unique situation where there's a group that could really help another group, but we have uh, misaligned incentives, right? We all know, I mean, I don't actually, I don't want to claim that we all know, but my, my assessment personally through my experiences, especially in watching the cannabis business grow, is that when you have the profit motive, the primacy of the profit motive, when you have unbridled, unchecked, uh, unmitigated, you know, put, exponential growth as a primary component of the business model. Um, when you have unsustainable practices that make products cheaper be a primary uh, model that many businesses employ, you have these external externalities that make it so that business is thriving, but society is not thriving. And so, part of the opportunity that we have right now at the beginning, at this emergence, at this period and point we're at right now, is to ask this really broad and big question, which is to say, what if we gather together a critical mass of these experts and defined a baseline of principles and values and then requested that anybody who sought to work with us to enter a business agreement to hire us or to give us funding that we, we held the bar really high and we invited everyone who is seeking to, to step into the space to meet us there. I do think that there is enough of a critical mass of people engaged with this work today that we could, that we do have that power, that the, uh, the, the experts in these, you know, tall, huge, uh, players that we have in the field today, people from maps and USONA and, and everywhere else, um, have the opportunity to create that invitation and to really clearly define what those principles are, what the ethics are, what are the values that people in this work care about? What are the lessons that we've learned from transformational psychedelic experiences? And how can we, how can we write those down, distill those, and then share them and create that baseline for us to gather upon? Mm -hmm. So that's really where our effort has been over the past several months. Mm -hmm. And this, we had a lot of ideas too about what we could do and where, and we have a lot, a lot of ideas about where we can go. And we decided to do this, this step of, of generating this baseline, of generating this ethics pledge with getting a lot of feedback and going through this, this process of inclusive stakeholding and, and really putting ourselves out there. And, and I also want to name that. This is work that we saw a clear need for, and we had a lot of conversations with a lot of people. And there's been this question raised about why us, who deputized us, Kat and I, and our other co-founders to do this work. And the truth is, is that the work just needed to get done. We need a vehicle and a container for this dialogue to take place and to offer not only critiques of our current system, but to offer real tangible solutions for our community so that we can step forward together and forge 
a pathway forward that is that is not business as usual. Hmm. Thanks, Liana. And to speak a little bit more about our process, um, after the launch of We Will Call It Paula, which is really one could say a problem statement, although some people could read that and say, what's wrong here? But I think, you know, in that dystopic love letter, um, many of us, including a lot of investors and entrepreneurs from around the world reached out and said, oh my gosh, I see myself in Leary and I don't want to be her or I don't want to produce the outcomes uh, illustrated here. Um, how can I do it differently? And to remember that there are so many um, positive intentions and the road to hell was paved with good intentions. And as Liana said, we don't know what we don't know. But all of that aside, with that launch, that was really uh, you know, identifying the problem statement. But now we're in the long, slow, tedious, humbling, um, at times like heart-wrenching work of driving collective impact and building solidarity and trust in relationships um, to actually be able to um, build these solutions that, that we're talking about and we'll talk more about. Um, so we joined forces as a team back in November and um, Liana, I'd love for you to speak a little bit to what yeah. it's like. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to get just a, a little bit vulnerable here and, uh, and share just a story. Um, our initial thought when we all joined forces was that we needed to host an event and we needed to do it right away. There was this immense sense of urgency around all this new energy and activity. There was a lot of people with a lot of questions showing up and not a lot of solutions. And so our initial response was, okay, let's do a gathering of 60 to 100 people. Let's do it ASAP. And we, we set that train in motion. And we made these invitations and there was people coming from multiple countries. And two weeks before the event was, um, it was like two or three weeks before the event was scheduled to take place. I got incredibly humbled by friends who are also members of this community um, who were, we were all at my house and I'll never forget the night. Um, and we were we were looking at our guest list and we were looking at who was coming and where the conversations were and we were recognizing that there was not enough diverse representation. And so I was having this dialogue with, with some people that I live with, um, one of them who's POC, and it was brought to my attention that there is always enough time for the right work. And one thing I was said is that, is that taking on this work was always something that feels really daunting because there's so many landmines and it's impossible to see all of the landmines that we're inevitably going to step on. And the friend said, well, that is what your community is for. They help you see the landmines that you cannot see yourself. And it became crystally clear in that moment that everything that we were seeking to shift about, um, about the way people were showing up to the space, having a sense of urgency, being paternalistic, um, producing some like expensive event, um, calling in all of the obvious and visible leaders who are often white male to come and have this conversation with. It all just like blew up in my face and it became really clear that we needed to completely rethink this strategy. We needed to not come out and stick a flag in the sand and say, hey, this is what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Come listen to us and follow us. And instead we needed to go completely back to our community, really humbly. And that's what we've been doing for the past several months is having a lot of very intensive, deep conversations with over a hundred different people. And these conversations are a starting point. And this pledge is a starting point. And this is also our invitation because it was community generated. And yes, we are the stewards that are, are pulling it through. Uh, and this whole project and the whole mission and the goal of what we're building can only work if there is buy-in from the community and if there is participation on the various working committees that we'd like to propose um, to, from our community. That is what's going to give us the power, the collective power and the collective authority to really generate that alternative pathway forward, one that decentralizes power, one that puts compassionate care over profit making one that centers patience, one that centers equity and justice, all of these things that we care to do as a community, 
we must, uh, our opportunity is to generate that authority collectively together. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Liana. And from here, you know, tracing that forward, we've continued to welcome and get feedback along the way and noticed in our process the ways that we continue to be challenged and inspired to uh, live up to the values that we hold. And, you know, the principles that North Star started with have now already been transformed through the process of the pledge based on speaking with many people here. Um, but to, to really ask the questions and grapple um, day to day as an organization, as we're trying to embody what the change we're wanting to see, seeing where we're missing the mark and aiming to be fewer and fewer degrees along the way while also trying to generate resources that empower our community, growing community of people coming in to, um, to operationalize our values in effective, sustainable ways. And so we've continued to get feedback. And I think one of the, one of the pieces that I hold deep in my heart as, um, as someone who is doing my best to be a white ally who has an immense amount of privilege uh, that I've had over the years, over the course of my life, being engaged in philanthropy and um, and other venues, and by the nature of who I am, um, and also really wanting to include and bring in and create space for a diversity of voices and be a bridge, because as we know, um, you know, a lot of the folks coming in, they may or may not. Um, have any interest in that. Um, but we are here to figure out together like these issues that we grapple with all the time on our listservs, in our interactions, in the ways that even the topics of this area, like I wish that right now I could be in the other panel, you know, <laughs> discussing, I think, what is it? Um, peyote or whatever happening in the other, like there's, how do we centralize our efforts and make space where everyone feels included? And this is a, an immense challenge. And so we're welcoming everyone here to participate and that we're working on building the infrastructure and support. And I saw in here that there are some folks who, who wrote in saying, you know, I reached out, I'm on your email list, I haven't heard from you. This endeavor takes an incredible amount of resources. And we have been pouring on a very nimble budget, a lot of time, energy, and resources into operationalizing this. And we have an incredible team to do that who come from a variety of backgrounds. And this is a process. So we need input from you and hoping also patience as we figure out these feedback systems that can really allow everyone to meaningfully participate. Yeah. So I'd like to just... Uh, throw down what we're tangibly doing and what our mission of North Star really is, okay? So we have a vision of creating community around a set of ethics and guidelines and best practices, as well as a community that centers the conversations and the topics that are really critical and important to the psychedelic movement as a whole. So that those conversations and topics get centralized in the way that, that people develop their businesses and whatever it be, for-profit, non-profit, it applies to everyone. Um, and one, there, there are many which ways we can go from here, but we decided to start with the pledge and to invite the community in and to generate community around this conversation because we have a deeper goal of creating a professional association that's grounded in ethics. And this is not, um, this is standard practice in any emergent industry or field that you would have an association of people who are identify as professionals who gather together to uh, bring forward the important conversations that people in their field work with. And I think the key difference here is that we get to do that well th through a lens of centering ethics. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is the larger vision of where we're going, and we're not there yet. We're not quite ready to launch a membership-based community and organization. We have another vision. The pledge is very focused on the individual and an individual's commitment to how they personally show up to this work in their field. We have a huge amount of feedback and interest in developing a set of metrics 
and, uh, and measurements and standards for companies and even developing potentially a certificate that could be audited um, against for companies that could be some sort of ethics certificate, much in the same way that there is an organic certificate on organic foods. And so we, this is kind of like the first step. We, we had so many ideas about, about the ways in which we could launch this. And we decided that we needed to launch it in phases because what's really critically important for us is that we, we don't, um, we, we are merely vessels and representatives for all of you out there and for all the people who care about the things that we care about. So we wanted to start with this pledge to create that feedback loop with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do foresee us moving in the direction of having a professional association, having a standards um, setting council that then would work. And if anyone is interested in participating on a council like that to define the ethics cer- certificate metrics for organizations, companies, and businesses, please do let us know because we'd love to have uh, participation from all of you on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and to that end, we um, there are plenty of other um, parallels and models to draw from. So there are things that are very unique to this, uh, this emerging industry. Dare we call it that? We actually have to contend with that. Um, and we have an opportunity to ground the sacred, dare I say sacred, right? These, it's like the sacred and the profane here together. We have to figure out how to bridge and integrate. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we each carry our particular medicine, our particular wisdom and gifts to bring to this. And there are other industries that have amazing examples. Are they perfect? No. But what an incredible opportunity to bridge and adopt um, as we are birthing a new industry, um, the best in class from other places and alter them as needed to support the needs of this particular uh, industry. Yeah. Like the steward model, or um, let's take a look at, there's a particular um, impact investment firm called Jubilee Partners in Oakland that is uh, starting a, essentially we're partnering with Lotus Foods to uh, a well-known organic uh, company that produces rice to partner with black farmers in the South um, to farm rice sustainably um, and create a product such as that. And in the beginning, developing uh, recoverable grants to low interest r- loans, which will eventually end up becoming you know, opportunities for private investment and potentially public investment. So there are, there are alternative models that are carrying values that, that I think many of us hold here um, that can work inside the system. And we can argue that the system sucks and decide not to participate. And, that, and that's fine. Like, you know, the decrim movement, religious freedom, right? There are a lot of avenues that need to be empowered as much as this one does. But medicalized access is going to be the framework through which many people will get care. And we know more than ever um, in times of COVID how essential not just mental health, but holistic uh, health uh, can be treated. And we have the Trojan horse to go and do that and partner with other people from these other industries with this kind of experience to create the uh, both harm reduction models and aspects operational models that we hopefully can feel really excited to support and and weigh in on the development of. Yeah. Thank you, Kat. I just, I really want to drive home that point, which is um, the reality that we face today. And and it is really important that there are, that we are develop, co-developing the access through the, the religious freedoms and spirituality and access through decriminalization. And but the reality that we're we're seeking to contend with and to actually rise to the occasion of meeting today is that the system of capitalism and the the dominant operating paradigm that we all currently exist in is the system where care is going to be delivered and where psychedelics are going to be uh, integrated into our society. And so these these two uh, things that Kat just spoke to one one question we've been contending with is. What are the best harm reduction? Uh, like this is the low hanging, you know, the lowest, the lowest amount of change, but like the, the biggest possible impact in terms of 
what can we do to reduce the potential harms of people who are coming into this space and setting up their businesses? So that's like one question that we have and that we're holding. The other question that I get really excited about is this aspirational question. There are there's a huge movement right now in finance and in also in business um, where people are employing and experimenting and, and piloting different models and programs. So MAPS is working with the public benefit corporation model. There's also a flex corporation model. Um, there's the B Corp model, of course. Um, in addition, there's um, uh, steward ownership. There's cooperative ownership. I've been wondering what it would look like to have a a, a franchise piece of software that ran the back end for therapy clinics, but that was collectively or cooperatively owned. Um, I've been, you know, wondering if venture capital dollars are the right source and form of dollars that can support the vision for decentralized ownership of clinics. Um, maybe what those clinics need is a low uh, interest loan that can be paid over a long horizon maybe that kind of capital and financing structure would be more supportive. I think we're hearing a lot about investors and entrepreneurs because those are the communities that like to come in when they see this opportunity to hit a bubble and hit the hype machine of a new emergent market. Those are the players that de generate the most amount of media and energy and activity. But this is we what we're really sitting, we're taking like, uh, we're leaning back and looking at the much longer journey that all of us are on. And that journey is how do we create the relationships, create the community? How do we individually show up to this work so that we can integrate these medicines, have culturally competent services available all across this country and all around the world in a way that truly reflects the spirit of these medicines. Mm -hmm. And that's our opportunity together if we all choose to, to, to raise to the rise to the occasion of this opportunity. I want to just go over and, and I think we'll be transitioning soon into questions and, and audience participation. Um, but just to go over the overarching themes of the pledge centered first in self work. Next, in building trust in our relationships, in gaining context in the history of the use of psychedelics and plant medicines from an indigenous perspective, from Western histories through the lens of the drug war systems of oppression as the context um, through which all of our actions um, are informed and will inform. Um, and showing respect um, to those traditions and giving back. And one of the things we don't talk explicitly about, but I think is inherent in this, is we're talking about power and talking about um, are we willing to leverage the individual and collective power we have now during this critical window, putting petty disagreements aside to um, create systems that also share power and create reciprocity and give back and give credit where credit is due and really dig deep and give fully to creating the world we want to see and that we need so desperately for all of our brothers and sisters and everything in between on this planet and this earth. And I think we have an incredible uh, opportunity here. And in the giving back, just to name that one of the things I hear so much um, echoed in this in this community with people I talk to is how little, um, how few dollars, say from the cannabis industry or elsewhere, go back to uh, support the Native American tribes and the lands on which we all stand in one way or another here in this country, um, and to the organizations and nonprofits that are making so much of this work possible, the advocates and activists, right, who are doing this work often pro bono um, with political persecution amongst all other kinds of persecution um, to actually be able to spell out. I think a lot of people actually want to give back, but they don't even know. For example, the Shumi Land Trust. If we're able to get this message to incoming community that are going to develop uh, businesses that will derive profit. One, if we have an opportunity to influence the business structures that they create 
and let's give some great ideas. And if they're pledging to give back or give a board seat to a body of nature or you know, a, a particular community group to be represented, let's influence that and let's tell them how it's possible. So us being able to illustrate this in um, a welcoming, intelligent and strategic way can give us the competitive advantage. And we hope that this pledge um, has enough of that, uh, enough meat um, that we can take it as a good enough starting place to now continue building out the structures and through participation um, in the coming months, decide what shape North Star needs to take to best serve the legacy community and the incoming community to center integrity and center this vision that we're all holding so dear. Yeah, thank you so much, Kat. I, there's one other key point that I really wanna make here before we turn it over to questions. And we are going to leave ample time for questions because we really coming here today is all about you all and engaging with you all on this and, and getting that feedback. Um, and the point I wanna make is that business as usual is here to stay. Uh, there's nothing that you know any one of us can do to really change that reality. There are going to be people who um, want to generate wealth that start up and stand up companies in the psychedelic space. And it is not our um, business to stop them. What it is our business to do is to generate positive peer pressure. And we've already seen this work. And I, um, I, you know, I noticed that after some conversations with myself and others, that the company Field Trip sent out a message about uh, adding a triple bottom line. And I'm still unclear, and they haven't clearly defined as to what that means to them. But define triple bottom line for everyone, Liana. Yeah, so triple bo bottom line is. Um, so I, I got it. yeah, people, profit, and the planet. People, profits, planet. It was the the planet. I couldn't think of the third P. Um, so that's the that's the triple bottom line. And so, but and and you know, there's groups like the social capital group and and um, the SVC. I dropped a link in here about the social venture circle who are saying that it's not enough to have three, a triple bottom line. You have to have a quadruple bottom line. And who are def adding in community and adding in a you know decentralizing power and all these other great things. Um, and so we've already seen what how what generating this conversation and inviting people to come and have it with us we've already seen the ways that it's impacting some of the biggest names in this field and how they're showing up and we're not here to police them and tell them what to do and what not to do our hope is that when we develop um with all of your help the uh this at the certificate of ethics for organizations and companies that that will be the tool that will have teeth in it. And that will be um, a consumer facing perhaps stamp of approval where now consumers can go and recognize, oh, this company or organization or facilitator or whatever have you um, is adhering to a set of um, guidelines and, and metrics and ethics that has been clearly defined by this broader community. And so, um, so yeah, I really just, the point here is that we have the opportunity to generate a lot of positive peer pressure. There's a lot of power that the leaders in this field and all the people working in this field really truly have. And so this is a, a unique window of time to, to, to harness and utilize that power and to generate the most amount of positive peer pressure as possible. Hmm. And I think we'd like to turn it over to questions here shortly, but I would like to actually take a moment to read a couple of the pledges that have already come in on our site. So you can hear a few other voices. We'll keep it anonymous for now. I pledge to first and foremost be an ambassador for the community, to understand that through a glo growing global awareness, I will have the opportunity and the responsibility to influence an individual's first experience with psychedelics and that the impression I leave may help guide that individual's approach. To me, integrity is leading by example at every opportunity and inspiring a healthy, loving, balanced, and respectful relationship between psychedelics and humankind. And here's another one. 
Acting with integrity in the psychedelic field means three things to me. One, improving upstream conditions where indigenous people live and the OG psychedelic plants, ayahuasca, te, I can never say that, no, not all, peyote and iboga are endemic so that the plants and the people they come from are perennially protected. Two, making the mark market ethical by developing new kinds of business models suited to the psychedelic space, like public benefit corporations, social enterprises, nonprofits, cooperatives, and religious organizations that redefine capitalism in the way Muhammad Yunus, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in economics, said we should. And three, investing responsibly by developing socially responsible investing SRI guidelines in the form of industry standards and requiring public ESG CSR reporting from all companies in the space in order to enable SRI and empower caring consumers to hold psychedelic com companies accountable. And the last just quick, just quick on some of those acronyms. Um, so CSR, corporate social responsibility, is one um, frame that a lot of organizations. I mean, there's we're in this moment now as well where where there's so many companies. Consumers are asking for companies to be more environmentally conscious, to, to have more empowerment of women in diverse leadership, mm -hmm. um, to not prioritize and maximize profits. So there's already like this, this activity happening. And the other one was ESG, um, which stands for environmental, uh, social and governance. And these are investment for, uh, ESG is a criteria that if companies meet, they get to participate in these, these special investment portfolios. And there's a huge class of investment portfolios and investors who are specifically interested in financing and funding organizations that meet the ESG criteria. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Liana. Yeah. And I'm going to read one more and then I think we can turn it over to questions. Sound, sound good, Liana? Yeah. Okay. Last one. I believe that everyone deserves the opportunity to have the best day of their life. Psychedelics offers the door for anyone to experience this. How do we accomplish this? By encouraging, not forcing self-examination. By creating psychological safety for anyone experiencing psychedelics. By training guides who have no interest in telling other people what to think, but are interested in people thinking for themselves. By destigmatizing psychedelics as much as possible, and creating spaces for easy reintegration and entry. By making it easy for clinicians without experience to start learning about psychedelics without judgment. By treating the private sector as potential allies, not enemies, and empowering them to make the right decisions about their psychedelic clinics that lead to maximum wellness. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we invite you all to share your voices and your own perspectives on what acting with integrity in this field means to you. That's great. Thank you both so much. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Are you ready for questions? Bring it on. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, that was, that was really amazing. And folks who haven't yet, I would definitely encourage you to to go through in detail uh the pledge itself i, I was pasting some of the the summaries uh in the chat here and i'll throw the, the link one more time there's actually each element of the pledge you can expand it out uh, and there are more detailed possible actions uh and so i would definitely invite folks to take a deep take a deep dive into it and uh and kat and liana i believe are both open to feedback on the on the whole thing um all right, so we got a, a lot of questions for you. Um, I, I'm going to start with the hardest ones. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, so the first question I'm going to ask, and I think you did address some of this already, but I'm just going to read the question kind of verbatim how it was given to me. Uh, it's from Dave Nichols on the Symposia team. Uh, so Dave's question, uh, he sent to me on Twitter, actually. Um, so his question for the North Star panel. Uh, why should the community trust a self-appointed regulatory body for ethics when uh, when Tim Chang is a partner at one of the uh, Silicon Valley's oldest VC firms with investing history in health, wellness, and data, and is looking to invest? And I know Tim is watching also. So, uh, but, and uh, so uh, he's looking to invest uh, in and or adjacent to the space. Um, and so Dave's comment here is that uh, Tim didn't disclose the association with North Star. 
uh, while promoting uh, the need for it in a podcast. And so what conflict of interest does this present? Uh, and then he also made a comment around a, a Wikipedia entry where the article may have been created or edited in return for undisclosed payments. Um, so I'll let you address that and, and Tim in the comments if you feel like addressing that further. Um, that's our question from Twitter. Thank you so much. I, I love that question. I think it's really important to be deeply considerate of all of the, the questions that were raised and of really looking at, yeah, for us, it's really about building trust, right? Like we need to build trust with our community members. And I'm just going to start with addressing the first point, which we kind of addressed earlier, which is that um, nobody appointed Kat or I or the rest of our team to do this work. What happened was really organic. We saw a need for this work to get done. We saw that we uh, were uniquely positioned as build, uh, bridge bridgers and bridge builders in our community to help generate and get the ball rolling on this work. And, um, and the pledge was, was crafted with input from so many dozens of people. Um, so it was really a, an effort. So I really see us as more stewards of this. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I want to say on that. And then in terms of Tim and his involvement, the investor group is an important stakeholder group to this process. And Tim also brings a unique, uh, ex unique experience and insight because part of what we are, are seeking is to create a compendium of alternative business models and economic models for people who are seeking to establish businesses in this space. And part of what Tim's been so great at is being a reality check. Is this solution too pie in the sky? Is it viable? Is it tangible? Would funders go for this? Um, and I don't want to speak too much uh, on behalf of Tim, and he's gone through his own transformation. But what I will say as well is that his VC firm, um, due to their contracts with their LPs, will never make an investment um, in, into cannabis or psychedelics or anything that's not federally regulated. And so they, they're not intending to do that at this time. That's, I think, and I think that's a very helpful clarification on what was a perceived conflict of interest. So, uh, yeah. And I would also like to say that, you know, as a, as a therapist, I am imperfect. I have had ruptures over the years with clients that is actually a, a core part of the healing process. But I won't get into that. <laughs> um, but but that happens in a much less public way, and where the the impact is in that sense very direct and relational versus um, this kind of larger, broader perception. And I I think what's core to remember here for all of us is that no single one of us is perfect, has figured it all out, um, or has all the answers. And even our team of five, though we have a very distributed background um, in terms of and our and our identities and whatnot, um, we don't have it all figured out. And we are learning and being humbled and learning forward, as we often like to say, um, as we go along. So um, to that end, um, I imagine Tim as well would say, "Yeah, I'm learning. I'm here because I care and I want to see um, take the knowledge that I have." and be in support with others to envision uh, the new way forward. As far as the Wikipedia thing, I just can't speak to that, so TBD. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll invite you know Tim to, I, I don't know if he's on the chat right now or not, but to, to answer that. Yeah. And if that doesn't feel sufficient in some way, like please let us know. Hmm. Yeah. Um, no, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving really direct answers uh, on all that stuff. Uh, and now another question here. This is from Jesse Hudson. So uh, next question is, how do you plan to prevent North Star, uh, the North Star Ethics Pledge from being a vehicle for psychedelic greenwashing uh, or tie dyeing? Uh, <laughs> uh, in order, um, so in order to make sure that the people who sign the ethics pledge are not just virtue signaling, uh, and in the name of empowering the psychedelic community, making the North Star Ethics Pledge a, a perennial plant in the psychedelics landscape, uh, are you willing to commit to requiring signatories uh, to submit periodic public reports in order for signatories to stay on the list? 
So yeah, I think this is really a question about phase two, right? Like the ethics pledge is phase one. The ethics pledge is us coming out to our community right now and saying, hey, we're, we're, we're here for this. We want to do this. We want to make this happen. We've got energy around it. We've been organizing around it and thinking about it. Do you think that this is a good idea? Is this work needed and necessary? Does this pledge speak to you and capture what you think is important? And if so, will you join us and come build by our side? That's phase one, because we don't get to do anything without the buy-in from this community. Like I said earlier, that's what generates the authority to then have a certificate that could have enough teeth that then could make those requirements. And it could also make organizations feel like they need to participate in or they're not going to be able to engage with this community meaningfully. So I feel like this is a, a, a phase two question and I'm super excited to, to bring that forward and to make those conversations happen. And in some alternative, alternative reality, we would have started there and I'm really glad that we didn't. But that was definitely um, one of the core orientations to our work from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would, go ahead. No, I'm go just ahead. Gonna add to that. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, trying to be a good, good Samaritan, share the space. Um, I totally lost it. Go ahead, Mike. I'll jump back in. Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't that. <laughs> no, no, not your yeah. fault. Um, well, I was just going to add it to, to, and this was a question I had as well that we spoke a uh, day or two ago about, um, but that the signing the pledge is not the same thing as being in the association, which has not been formed yet, right? So right. signing the pledge is a necessary but not sufficient condition to get certified as a part of the North Star Association, but yeah. more of a personal commitment that you're and making. You're starting with, yeah, and having been, you know, having been in discussion with folks involved in open science um, statement, uh, which by note is not a pledge because even having a pledge itself is quite controversial. Um, And this, this term virtue signal has been a regular, like those are words that regularly fall out of our mouths. Like how do we, like, these are the questions. Um, And having just gone through a, a quite a process around publishing the equity and inclusion statement and seeing um, the positive peer pressure of individuals, there were organizations that signed on to that, but it was primarily, again, starting from within as individuals and in the context of relationship, where they then actually, there were examples of people taking that um, that statement to their organizations and saying, hey, why haven't we signed on to this? Or, hey, how do we operationalize this? And then that starts much needed discussion through relationships, which is the heart of accountability, Right. And that's one very important form and the one that we are starting with. And then we're going to get into organizational um, accountability and, you know, third party certifying boards that's down the line. But these are the core steps now. And this is just a virtue signal unless those of us taking the pledge from the individual level choose to take this to heart, have an opportunity to make that pledge public as a statement, to share it with their mentors, to share it with their peers, their colleagues, to encourage others to make this a big deal. Um, And then from there, participate with us in building out these infrastructure pieces that we're talking about that really can allow it to have teeth. Because if you look at that pledge and you go into the possible outcomes or possible actions, we could do a choose your own adventure. We can, and I hope we will down many of these rabbit holes to build out um, the pathways to educate, contextualize, provide resources for mediation, for organizational development, for, um, you know, drawing in resources from these alternative or these other industry practices to to make this really have teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also you're embodying your own principles here, building trust Mm -hmm. first, right? And moving slowly. Um, so there, yeah. yeah, I just want to like, you know, the moving slowly has been something that like, I mean, my sense of, of urgency is part of my own conditioning and indoctrination, um, and socialization that is tied into Eurocentrism and privilege and my whiteness and everything related to that. And so I, I you know, it's something I've been uh, grappling with throughout this whole process is like, 
oh, we need, we need this work. It needs to happen now. We need, people are starting companies now. We need to get the thing in place and, and do all of this work now. And this whole process has been like a huge deep breath. And I, time and time again, taking a pause and an even deeper pause to ask who's showing up right now, whose voices are in the room, whose voices are not present. How can we go and engage those voices? So I think this is, again, like lessons from these experiences. And I think where we're at right now is like, and what's brought us to this moment is like, this is our time to, to galvanize and harness our community in this moment to then take us to that next level. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Annie Oak. Uh, so, and Annie Oak's, uh, uh, and check out Lucid News, side note, which is some of the teeth, actually, I would say, on the other side of this is journalism. Um, and her question is, uh, could the panelists please comment on the business model and patent strategies pursued by Compass Pathways and Atai Life Sciences which is helping Compass raise funding. Mm, such a, a big conversation. Um, and, you know, my comments are this. My comments are that IP is, is definitely a, what is used to raise funding dollars against. Um, companies go and propose, we're going to go own this intellectual property and make all of this money off of it. So we are an amazing investment. Give us all your money. That's like, how a lot of and the, the major plays in, in psychedelics right now are biopharma um, te biotech startups. So these are drug developing groups and startups. And I can speak from the MAPS perspective. It's extremely expensive to develop drugs through the FDA process. And I know, Mike, earlier today, you had a comment on maybe what we need to look at changing the FDA process in general, um, which is a conversation for another time. Um, but what I, what I will say is that at this stage right now, like or in North, uh, North Star as a group is not here to prescribe what people do or don't do. We're here to set a culture and to point to the best ethical operators in the space. And it's one of the reasons I'm really proud to work for MAPS. MAPS has a commitment to open science. We had the opportunity to file IP on the method of manufacturing process for MDMA. There's about like 10 or 11 that we came up with and decided to put that in the public domain and put that in the open source. And MAPS has consistently made that choice. MAPS has consistently uh, made the choice to remain a nonprofit, to do the commercial activities in a way that can feed back the overall mission of MAPS and to be a public benefit corporation. And so, Rather than sitting here saying, oh, these people need to change X, Y, and Z, I want to really highlight the, the, the best actors in our field and space and encourage others who want to start projects to emulate those best actors. Um, and while I'm highlighting some excellent actors, I just want to name Dr. Bronner's. I mean, we don't have to look far to see one of the best examples in consumer products on our planet. Um, Dr. Bronner's um, is committed to regenerative agriculture. Um, here's a fun fact. Their highest paid employee can only ever get paid five times more than their lowest paid employee. Many big companies like that, the, the ratio is more 60 times or like even 100 times what the lowest paid employee is made. So um, they have a, a huge uh, focus on philanthropy. They redirect a lot of their profits back into making a more the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible. And so um, there's a, some really amazing examples for us to point to and point towards. Um, in terms of, of Compass and Atai in these groups, you know, we're applying our positive peer pressure. We're pointing out these things to them, but they're going to be and do what they're going to do. And I'm really inspired by this question of what is it that we want to go and build and create in the world together? Yeah, I think just echoing Liana's last point, we have, um, it's going to be a both and, right? Compass already exists. A tie already exists. Uh, Johnson and Johnson and S ketamine already exists. Um, and there are playbooks, well known and um, paradigms, well grooved that are driving those operations. And we have we the the more we can do the same, right? create the neural networking and strengthen that neural networking 
and build a mycelial network for that neural networking, then the more value the approach that we're creating has and the more weight, like gravity, it has in terms of positive peer pressure and consumer um, education and choice. Um, and I want to actually highlight um, ESG um, uh, and socially responsible investing principles that when they came out, they were not considered a threat whatsoever to mainstream investing. And I had a great talk with, you know, somebody who was very, very central um, in this movement and has watched the span of it over time. And now there is essentially no investment firm that does not offer some version of socially responsible investing because consumers demand it. Now, is it enough? No. Is it the perfect version? No. But I think it is a tribute to uh, the long, I was going to jokingly say the long con, but like this is the long term strategy for us to be effective, um, to end up seeing what we want to see over time. And then we will have, right? There, there's the version that exists in the Capital One, or I don't know, I'm just throwing out a name. And then there's the, those that exist, like I just described, that, um, you know, are really, um, have a lot more meat to it. And we want to have a full range of men, uh, of options on the menu. Yeah. And, mm. and one thing I'll add is um, the commercialization and the corporatization of psychedelics is here. It's happening, you know, and what we're saying here is that that is going to be the way forward unless we generate another way forward. Mm -hmm. And this is our opportunity to do that together. Mm. Great. Um, yeah. So the the next question, it's kind of related, but um, yeah. so you, you may have answered this most already, but I'll ask it anyway because I think it goes a little it goes a little bit more specific and and follow up. But Jeff asks, you know, he says I applaud your efforts to uh, give some guidelines. There was a prior attempt by Council on Spiritual Practices to get companies interested in psychedelics to commit to open science. Uh, major for profit players like Compass Pathways simply declined to sign. Why wouldn't those who are focused on making a profit do the same with this pledge? Where is the accountability for the experts who enable these companies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, this has been answered in various ways. Um, and yeah, Kat, do you want to add something here? Because I'm going to gather this thought and then come Will back. you ask the question again? Yeah. So it's kind of along the same lines, but the question is, um, you know, what's going to stop people from just simply not signing the pledge like they've done with the uh, statement of open science? And the follow up, the second part of the question is accountability for experts. So I'm assuming this is meaning experts within the legacy community who are enabling uh, the companies that are that are not operating, you know, in the ethical way that we want. Uh, so what's the accountability for, for our experts those are, here? Those are two separate questions, and I'd like to just answer them one at a time. Um, one comment on the experts is like one thing I've been finding and having a lot of these conversations is that even the experts in our field, they don't know what to ask or how to do appropriate or proper due diligence. Mm -hmm. And so one of the tools that, that we are, that is in process and we have a form of it developed, but we're, you know, in our feedback process around is actually a set of questions that anybody can ask any potential business partner, investor, anyone who's looking to hire them so that they can generate and do their own gut check on whether or not that group or individual is aligned with them. And I think that this is part of why we found ourselves in this is that people don't know what they don't know. And we have a bunch of researchers and experts that don't know what to look out for when somebody's coming to them with a really shiny looking opportunity and deal. And so that's one of the tools that we're hoping to, to generate. And we, we there's a I'll just name too, there's a, a couple of other tools like that that we have in the works that we're seeking to create to empower our community with the information that they need to make appropriate and responsible decisions for themselves. Um, and then your other question was about why, oh, um, and it was about why people just won't sign. And this is where, you know, we get into the consumer demand. And our, our vision and like the, the thing I'm holding is like, can you imagine a future where companies and products either have a North Star ethics certificate or they don't? And then consumers are able to make choices based on what they know about that. Mm -hmm. And so, and, um, 
Yeah. So I think like, let, let's make it supremely uncool if people don't get on board with this reality, right? Yeah, I think that, mm. that like shout out to Annie Oak and many others um, around the let's throw a better party and saying it a bit tongue in cheek, but actually quite seriously that we have an opportunity to shape and change culture. And I think about even, you know, for how many years now, you know, with my own family, with my parents who are like, you know, why organic? That's a waste. And like now, like really just recently are like actually consuming organic products. But that's the trajectory we're talking about here. And the truth is, um, we could leave today and all of you could decide this isn't worth it. It's a pie in the sky idea. I'm not signing the pledge. Then yeah, we won't see what's actually possible here. Um, but I think we can look back and see that there, you know, look how much we've referenced today and in many other venues, the open science statement. Did it stop and halt everything else? No. But has it, ha has it centralized these conversations and the, the critical decision making um, in the collective? Absolutely. And things are shifting because of that. Um, and to this point around um, kind of empowering clinicians and researchers to be able to relate with people who are approaching them with opportunities and resources um, beyond just their, their intuition um, and own sense of integrity, but actually empower them um, with some level of understanding and uh, guidelines to really see what they should say yes or no to or require. And one of those things gets to be, have you signed the ethics pledge? If not, why not? If yes, tell me about your process with it. In what ways are you engaging with it? And to the other effect, oh, you want to make an investment. Have you signed the ethics pledge? Or, oh, I'm considering being part of this firm that is making investments in psychedelics. Has your firm committed to aspects of this, right? So there, this can end up being a reference point in all directions if we choose right now in this moment to say, yes, this is good enough. We'll keep working on it and let's build momentum around it um, to have it mean as much as uh, we want it to mean so we can, can claim, claim our stake here in, in helping shape the future of this movement. There are really good points. Uh, and particularly, you know, you get the open stains statement doesn't have teeth, but it, it's creating, we're having conversations now because it exists. And so this is really great that, yeah, so you're not, making teeth at this stage here but the fact that we have something to reference uh and so it's it falls on everyone's watching all of us to then how are we using this ethics pledge how are we referring to it how are we embodying it uh so it's not just that you're creating the rules but you're offering a tool for people to incorporate into all of our processes and um, quite frankly can i just say on a personal note having this the a guiding force for my life since even as a rebellious teenager, there was something inside of me that has been committed to this question around what does it mean to be in integrity? And that has often felt like a very lonely experience. And to be now with all of you in a conversation that is centering integrity at the heart of our discussion, no matter what we're talking about, that to me is a gift. And anybody who wants to join in a conversation around that, this is an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I also want to echo something. Liana, earlier you mentioned that the questions that will be provided. Yeah. Uh, and, I, um, and for one thing, I, I know even conversations you and I have had have helped me to have questions because of all the different things that are showing up now. And that is a very helpful thing. There, it was asked in the comments here, are those questions published and available? Mm -hmm. Um. Not yet. There, we would like for them to be. Um, because of the nature of this work, we do take a lot of very extra time in making sure we get things just right. I saw somebody right here, like perfect is the, the enemy of progress, I think. And, you know, so we are dealing, contending with a bit of that. But it's also like being in this position is a unique position to be in. And so we want to ensure that we have our pieces in place. But Mike, I've shared with you a version of those questions. Yeah. Um, and the point of 
of that tool. And the point of the tools that we're hoping to generate are, again, not to be prescriptive, not to tell somebody what to say or do or think, not to um, give people my own personal opinion about other companies or individuals who are ha- who are working in the field, but to empower people with the tools and the information and the questions to ask so that they can make decisions for themselves that are in line and aligned with what they believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also want to say that some of the feedback we received was a question around, you know, why doesn't the pledge include as value holders in the space committing to not um, giving their, um, we'll call it their own IP, their own experience, their own legitimacy, their own credentials um, to questionable sources, right? And, and even something like that, there, there could be a movement of that that could be born out of this if people really want to say it. it's like, because we do have um, a vast amount of knowledge, experience, access, credibility that we can leverage here. Um, so just to say, like, there are many pathways we could choose to go down. And this is one centralizing place right here in the funnel. And we're all autonomous and agents in this, right? But we can all choose not to give our information to people who are not uh, taking the pledge. Mm-hmm. I invite that. Um, great. Any other comments on that question? Or do you want the next one? Go ahead. All right. Uh, the next one's from Raquel. Um, do you have any thoughts on Mind Bloom and their entry into the ketamine space? I have thoughts on what kinds of questions you can ask. <laughs> what kind of questions would you ask? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't have them in front of me, so I don't want to, like, jump into it. Um, I'm wondering if I can, like, quickly pull them up. But, yeah, I think that, you know, Mind Bloom, there's other companies like Mind Bloom, And I think we're going to continue to see people who don't have a history of working in this field who are not mental health care professionals or providers who don't work or have a history of working in, in, in healthcare at all, um, who see an opportunity, who have, you know, some flashy tech capabilities and who can generate a business. And so my, my, my thought there is that I would like for them to deeply consider what we put forward in the pledge and to answer the question, What does acting and integrity in this field mean to them? And I would like to invite any of the entrepreneurs or any of the founders or leaders of these companies to publicly answer that question and to do that work with themselves to really get into their deepest why um, they are coming and showing up to do this work. Um, One of the ways that we do that is, you know, through, and this is something that's been such a, a blessing on our team is the relationships that the five of us have spanning across various stakeholder groups is one still not enough. (laughs) Um, And we're working to grow uh, our mycelial network all the time, but two, to the extent that we have had, um, you know, connections to people that one of us alone wouldn't. So we've been able to leverage that network um, and through these conversations start to build stronger and stronger ties with with various organizations. And so uh, we are thick in that process. And I think we all have to ask ourselves, who do I know that knows this person who's a part of this organization? And how do I step towards, not away? Mm -hmm. How do I call in, not call out? Mm -hmm. And actually bring people towards us so we can as Liana says, ask that question. How do you navigate uh, the issues around um, profitability and sustainability with what you are aspiring to do, which is deliver much needed services to suffering people? What does it look like for, you know, do you have a relationship with integrity? What does that mean to you to actually just ask these questions at the end of the day? And I think that's at the heart of this pledge is that we are all individual actors making up any of these systems. And I think the bigger they get, right, when you get to the level of a, of a multinational corporation, the, the role of any individual, it becomes to some extent superfluous because it is its own uh, machine, but there's so much room beyond that. And there are so many ways that, that we can leverage our relationships and how we show up in those micro ways that can really have a, a profound ripple effect. Mm, thanks. Um, 
Next question is from Grace. Uh, what advice do you have for young people who are naive but are passionate about contributing their part? Any words of caution? Mm. Yeah, I really, I really love that question because I remember myself back when I was 18 and discovered mushrooms and um, <laughs> took myself on quite a wild several year journey um, and did not know then what I know now. And I'm really grateful for it and for all my experiences and for all the crazy situations I got myself into um, with that unskillful uses of psychedelics. Um, so in terms of advice, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is that I think a lot of us put a lot of weight into these transformational experiences. Um, and of course, they're powerful and special. But my, my number one advice is that the, the, the psychedelics are not the point. That the point is the transformation and the integration of the experiences that you gain from the insights, which are often catalyzed through these powerful substances. But they're not the point. And so that would be a number one piece of advice. And then in terms of, um, yeah, how they can get more engaged and more involved, it just kind of depends on the individual and what, and what, what their unique skill and offering is and how, I mean, look, like there's going to be uh, so many new things, new groups, organizations, companies forming over the next several years. So the types of roles, so early on, it was like, you know, when I started getting involved in this movement, I was like, oh, I can't, there's nothing I can do here because I'm not a researcher. I'm not a therapist. I'm not an expert. I actually am a college dropout with no degrees or, or credentials. Mm -hmm. And so I found, um, I found myself not really knowing like what my role was or like what place. And I ended up doing a lot of community building with different psychedelic societies. That's one Good advice for young people is to work like go find your local psychedelic society or if you're in college or students for a sensible drug policy chapter and start there um but what's changing now is that is that now i mean we're going to need people who have social media skills who are marketers who are um operations experts who have it skills to get engaged and involved with building out this entire field um so yeah, kind of brambly, but that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. Kat, are, you, are you there still? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, I'd add to that um, seeking mentorship and going slow. Yeah. Mm. And developing a relationship with people and to the extent in, in the legal, safe, well-guided ways to get to know the medicines. Um, and this integration piece, to be honest, I feel like at this point in so many ways now, like, and I feel so blessed that my work, the, the, um, the crucible of this work that happens to be centered on psychedelics as the subject matter, as the content, this process itself serves for me as one epic journey, <laughs> um, where I am getting schooled all the time and asked to connect with myself and source and my ancestors and my allies and calling on teachers and mentors um, all along the way. Um, and so the hope is to create more and more avenues for that, for people who want to have that kind of experience, to, to have that kind of experience in their, their work. Um, and I think a great way to do that is check out um, Students for Sensible Drug Policy. They have a, a student a pipeline where they actually pair you with a mentor. So really volunteering, finding a mentor um, are great tools for that. And, and thank you for the asking the question. Yeah. I think I've had, the last thing I'll say, I think I've had kind of an opposite experience to many people. I think a lot of people coming into this space um, are bringing skill sets from other backgrounds, having their own awakening, um, and then getting to apply those uh, skill sets to this movement with much needed um, areas of expertise. And that's one way to go. I feel like I actually kind of had the opposite because I was um, lucky enough to have the privilege and access and, and dumb luck or whatever 
to meet my teachers and engage very deeply in this work and spending extended times uh, down in Peru and in the jungles, starting at the age of 23, which at the time I felt very at odds because I was doing something, especially at that time, like very different than my peers. And I felt behind in certain ways, but obviously that fed into my um, going to get my training to be a therapist and working as a consultant and doing, you know, a bunch of other stuff. But in, and so now I'm actually kind of coming the opposite way. So I think just kind of noticing the lifelong view and, and there are different ways to come at it. And hopefully you get a lifetime of gathering and honing your skills and doing your deep personal work and volunteering and finding ways to be of service and following um, what's needed, what you're capable of or capable of growing into and what gives you passion. Hmm. I just, one more thing, just do the work. That's it. Just do, this is an inside job. All of this is. And so that's, that's the number one thing that I think is, is kind of, um, yeah, our first, our first pledge uh, principle is start within. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that there's time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Move on the speed of trust. Yeah. Those are, those are really great points. And I, I want to echo what you both said around, um, you know, finding mentors. And there's actually someone put the, Wes put the link on the chat there to the SSDP mentorship program, um, you know, grounding into your local existing communities, whether it's psychedelic societies or SSDP. And um, I think that that applies not only to people who are self-aware of being young and naive, but this also applies to people who are the opposite side of the spectrum, who believe that they know the answer and are here to save everything and are here to come and make the new psychedelic startup that's going to change the world. Even more so, those people, please ground in, get mentors. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can just add one more thought here, which is that that's actually like a deeper vision that we're hoping we can generate by establishing this community, this professional association, is that we, we hope that we're able to mentor and match newcomers in with elders and mentors um, so that we can have that exchange of information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is part of the, the higher vision we are hoping to call in. Yes, ground in to the community. Um, next question uh, is from Lucid News. Is North Star a nonprofit or for-profit and what is the organizational structure? Who has provided the funding to date and is there a board? And I think you're on the record here. <laughs> yeah. Can I take this? Yeah, go. Mm -hmm. Uh, to start anyway. Um, so North Star is being incubated by uh, Oren Project. And Oren Project uh, is in its process of applying. It's a it's a state um, public benefit corporation applying to the IRS as a 501c3. And we're currently fiscally sponsored by MAPS. Thank you, MAPS. Um, and Oren Project, or, and North Star is, is through that um, being held and uh, funded by Oren Project, it, the incubator wing. And the funding to date has been uh, largely in-kind donation of uh, our staff um, donating their time and expertise, and also seed money from Oren Project or its wing, which is a donor advised fund called Oren Fund. And that's been in the amount of some around $25,000 uh, Tim Chang has also donated both in kind and um, in uh, funds somewhere around the amount of, I think, $17,000. We, we can and will publish this. Um, and then we have another grant from Shelby Clark from for $10,000. And really, in total, I think we've done all of this work in a total dollar amount of around $65,000. Um, and so we are very much in the same question of grappling with how do we center integrity, equity, and ethics while building a sustainable model? Um, so if North Star um, spins out from Oren Project, there's a chance that it could stay if it's able to be housed by Oren Project makes sense. It will stay there, but there's a chance that it might need to spin out and be its own thing for a variety of reasons. And there is a world, as Liana said, in which uh, if there's enough value here, um, that people get enough out of what North Star offers, that it's worth paying membership dues, that also cohes and bring together the community and allow us to 
continue to provide ongoing backbone support to really operationalize community building um, and asset creation, resource generation. Um, then we may be looking at a membership-based association, and that I think there, there are models for that that are both for-profit and non-profit, um, but all with the aim of simply putting that back into, uh, for the most part, paying for people's time um, because we need that level of expertise. Um, so uh, I think that's it for now. Liana, you want to add? You said it all, yeah. And just, just that, you know, uh, we are looking at what it would look like to, to do a membership-based professional association, organization, consortium, something like that. And so we, we, we are hoping that that would be able to generate some revenue that could support the team who's holding this work. Um, and one thing I'll say is that I'm a full-time employee of, of MAPS and 100% of my time on North Star has been in kind. And um, so, yeah, that, that's my yeah. side of it. Same here, and as executive director of, of Orin Project, I've committed to not receiving a salary um, for the foreseeable future, and that is part of the ways that I give back for the privileges that I have to, to participate in this movement. Hmm. Thank you for all the transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was one other part of the question, which was about the board. Oh, Kat? Well, just to say, because... Um, North Star is still in this incubation phase from Orin Project and doesn't stand alone with any um, official agency or entity. Um, we have the board of Orin Project, which as of right now is very small. And once we get this launch going, we'll be in the position of being able to expand our board and be with these questions around who needs to be at the table. Um, but for now, it's just myself, uh, Sherelle Noble, uh, Secretary, and Tim Chang as Treasurer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if North Star uh, gets enough legs under it, it to be its own organization, which we believe is moving in that direction, um, we will be putting together a board for that as well. Great. Um, yeah, I'm really excited just to say really excited to get to, you know, we've been working with a, an organizational development coach um, who's I just can't sing his praises enough. Will Grant um, Synthesis Guide and his background is um, wide sweeping from uh, living on um, uh, living on native lands in New Mexico for many years doing organizing work there to land stewardship to cryptocurrency like he's got quite the span of experience and, and a deep deep heart and a lot of wisdom and um, you know we're working with him or have in the past and, and really looking at these models that we could apply to ourselves so we get to experiment ourselves with what would it look like to have um, a body of nature have a board seat on uh, North Star? What would it look like? You know, what are the the groups, the stakeholder groups that we need to ensure are represented here? Um, so it's it's an exciting time for us to really be in the practice of 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 being in the process and iterating and and modeling and experimenting with what we want to build. Yeah, I just want to I just want to highlight that it's looking like Paul Stamets is making that visionary move, and he's seeking to establish a board seat for the voice of the mushrooms in his. Um, he's got a few companies, and then this holding company, um, and so that's just a really inspiring. And there's a whole group who's focused on uh, generating board seats for bodies of nature. And there's I won't get into the details of how that's set up and like what kind of councils are needed and how that all works, but these are the types of considerations and types of visionary applications that we're interested in piloting and trying out together. It'd be interesting to see how that works. Uh, how do you, how do they vote? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I like kind of don't want to get into it, but like, you know, essentially there'd be a nominated group of people, right. That are representing the voice of the mushrooms that, then like make that decision collectively or maybe it's one person but you know i imagine it's somebody who would be like an expert not paul but somebody else mm -hmm. you know, so cool uh interesting to see how those uh, shake out um next question is another one from raquel uh do you think there needs to be appreciation for our psychedelic elders who informed our current clinical work and if so how could that be accomplished in a just and pragmatic way mm -hmm. 
And I don't, I don't know if I'm reading within the lines here, but maybe she's also referring to people who have been working on the underground as well. You, you know, aren't, it's not as easy to recognize. Um, so how do we, how do, how do we do that? I think I'm so grateful for this question, Raquel. And, and I'm just thinking back to our, our first official stakeholder dinner, which we very purposefully uh, conducted with elders and wisdom keepers in the field, both folks above ground and also below ground um, who came together with us and entrusted us enough to have this conversation um, because we wanted to hear from them first. And this is so much about intergenerational um, bridge building and stewarding. Um, and so that is a place that we've started that is incomplete that we'll keep coming back to and um, also nurturing not just us inside of North Star or in Project, but with other uh, partners in the field who are very much holding this question. Um, both disenfranchised communities who have been disproportionately um, negatively impacted and incarcerated for this, right? That is a whole uh, group that that needs um, needs our support, um, as well as folks who've been disenfranchised culturally from access to these medicines. Uh, a lot of communities of color who have, uh, for these variety of reasons, been disconnected from this work. Um, and also elders and wisdom keepers who've been carrying this work underground um, and in the research and clinical trials over the last number of decades and advocacy. Um, I will say there are a number of initiatives to figure out how to blend, um, how to partner with, you know, international retreats um, or with clinics or organizations to actually pair mentors and to actually potentially create boards of elders that actually um, organizations forming can go to them and have them as their allies and hopefully um, in appropriate ethical means have compensation for that. Um, and I will say, I'm just, this is just like something that I, I dream of is a sponsor, sp sponsor an elder <laughs> program. <laughs> And there's initiatives like Michael Ziegler, who is compiling um, videos and interviews with a number of elders in the field so that more people can get access to their wisdom um, and have reciprocity in place. And so this is a central question that um, we're holding in our hearts and in our thinking and our strategizing and, and really want others to join with us in ways to operationalize that from the ground up. Yeah, um, just to echo what Kat said there, I just, you know, I, I want to, I'm like what, questioning whether or not to name this, um, but I was part of some fundraising efforts during the time when Sasha Shulgin was at the end of his life. And it was really intense to realize that this person who had contributed so much to our field, who gave his life and gave up his career in, in as, a, as a chemist with Dow chemicals and this kind of comfort to really like bring this work forward and was just such an extraordinary pioneer um, was in such great need at the end of his life. And I am aware of a project. I don't know like what state it's in or stage it's in or anything, um, but that's been like another idea I've heard around the community is a project to support um, many elders who have worked in this field, especially in the underground they don't have IRAs or retirement savings. Um, they don't have access to, um, you know, different funding programs and things like that. So having a way to provide support for our elders, whether or not it's like in a hospice care facility that's based in community. I mean, there, I've heard a lot of uh, ideas and beautiful visions around this, but I think it's, so critically important and i think like one of the things we have a set of lists of possible actions and one of our principles is give back and it's this idea of reciprocity and so i'd like to develop that list of possible actions to include different organizations donations you know sponsor an elder um any sort of programs like that that get developed by our community so that we can highlight that and and put that forward and that's part of what you know, collecting this work together in this format might be able to provide us, um, might be able to allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, psychedelic social security. Yes. 
<laughs> um, cool. Thank you. Uh, all right. So the next question we have, and we are at the last like five minutes here. Wow. Um, the last question's from Darlene. Um, what do you think of the idea of buying stock in startups? They may not necessarily have a mission apart from profit over ethics in order to engage in shareholder activism. And uh, she says, MindMed is one company that appears not to share the ethics of North Star. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this lately and also just speaking really transparently that part of the privilege that I carry has actually been inheriting some money. And in that, I've inherited um, some stocks that I don't feel good about being a part of. And so I've had to really engage with educating myself and um, making these hard decisions through that education process of where is there actual significant value to the places where like, you know, I'll just be really transparent, like a lot of cost to sell those stocks and invest somewhere I feel better about it. Um, and in some cases, that is the move. Like I want out of that. But there's uh, the shareholder activism is another way, and it has proven to have um, impact. For example, you know, plastic straws. I think it's McDonald's uh, taking out plastic straws. Like that's due to shareholder activism. Is that changing McDonald's overall? No. But is that actually a significant impact? Yes. Um, as far as being proactive in getting involved in that way with something you don't already know, uh, own. I think that's a really good question and I I think it deserves further merit. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Kat. I just dropped a link in there too to a, a nonprofit called As You Sow. Um, I'm friendly with Andrew Behar who started that and they do a lot of shareholder activism. And so I've been, I'm very familiar with tracking this. And But my, my initial response is don't invest in the things you don't believe in. Put your energy, attention and resources into growing and building the world that you do believe in and that you want to come into fruition and participate in making a reality. Um, shareholder activism has worked, but these are like with mega huge companies and mega huge amounts of shareholders. Mm -hmm. So with smaller companies, and if you're a smaller shareholder, I think it can have less of an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and you tend to have less of a relationship to that impact. And this is where I think our community is still small enough or this industry, whichever words you want to use, they'll be triggering to some whichever way. Um, this more like, who do I know that knows? Who do I know to actually broaden our network beyond our echo chamber of those that more easily align with us and see how we can actually reach people. I mean, if you actually look at even like turn out the vote or if we get into not actual politics, but, but strategy is... How do you actually reach people door to door? How do you connect with people you know or closer to you um, to bridge? And I think that that is what Liana is, is um, pointing to here. And I think this is certainly where we're, we're best to start now. Hmm. Cool. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, it's from Melissa. Uh, how have you incorporated, how do you plan to incorporate indigenous voices and traditions in your work and emerging community? Uh, if you've discussed your work with any indigenous groups, can you share their thoughts? Thank you so much for that question. And I wanted to even bring it up before to say, to, to crowdsource back to you all to name that um, this is an area that we've seen happen time and time again, and where um, we are reifying the process that thus far we have not had formal engagement with any indigenous groups. Also, because it is uh, a can of worms with very unique, um, it also depends. There's indigenous folks living, um, you know, in cities and towns, and there are indigenous folks living on reservations or in other countries. And there are very specific um, applications of what it looks like to make sure that our work serves them. But in terms of bringing um, their voices in, um, we are now at the phase with the launch of this to want to bring in more folks like that. So if folks want to be at the table with us, we are absolutely here and, and seeking that. Um, and ideas from others about how we can incorporate folks. Because at times we've reached out to people and haven't gotten a response. And so we keep asking the question, um, 
what are we doing wrong or what could we be doing better? And so bringing that question here to us, because this is something that I think um, shows up in many initiatives across this space, across many spaces. And so really engaging with this question uh, together is important and we're open. Yeah. And the, the few Indigenous um, folks that I've shared this pledge with um, have, I mean, their primary, the primary concern has to do with reciprocity and ensuring that anyone who might benefit, especially personally gain from any of these sacred medicines that they hold carefully um, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I, what's coming to mind as well is it's often a question of land security as well. Um, so there's a, a strong request that they are included in the reciprocity and highlighted. And we do include that in the initial draft, in the, the draft, the pledge that we have now published. It's no longer in draft form. Um, <laughs> um, many drafts. And, um, but yeah, as Kat said, you know, we're, we're creating these invitations and having these conversations and our, our process has been imperfect and we are really looking for ways to, um, have more engagement. Mm -hmm. Also while recognizing that a lot of what this pledge is geared at are the, um, newcomers who are building organizations and businesses within this field. And, um, I have one, you know, indigenous friend response that was like, this doesn't really apply to me. I'm not intending to, to go and build a business or construct anything like this in our field. And so um, what did apply to her was these concepts of starting within, building trust, doing all of this work. And I think that's really where, um, where we've done a lot of kind of refocusing back onto the individual and how each one of us are showing up in this process. And so we have had some, some engagement, but nowhere near the extent that we feel is sufficient. Mm -hmm. And I know we need to stop now. So as you wrap us, Mike, just to say that this today, this honor to be with all of you and share this, this drop in the bucket of the body of work that we hope that you all will sign up to, to do with us. Um, if you feel like this is a good enough aspirational and inspirational um, piece of work, this pledge that we can galvanize ourselves around and build this movement, please sign this pledge. If you don't feel comfortable, please provide feedback on the pledge. There's a link to do that. Um, and share your statement on the website and or um, on social media. Email your networks. Let's make this pledge visible and center integrity in the building of this industry. Thank you. And I guess, yes. we, should I give my final thought? Give your final thoughts, please. Yeah. I cannot do this without all of you. There's no way. And I really believe in us, the great royal we, and I think that we have this golden and unique opportunity to define a culture and to define for ourselves and for anyone else who's caring to join the psychedelic renaissance alongside of us. Uh, to define that and to step into that and hold that power. And so that is, we are, we are, we are here with this offering of an opportunity and we hope that you'll join us and come build by our sides. Great. Where do people contact you to get involved? Uh, I just dropped my email in uh, the thread here, liana at orinproject.org. Um, right. And Kat just dropped hers in. And you can also find us without trying too hard. <laughs> on our website, www.northstar.guide is our website. You yeah. can get more information there, sign up. And as you've seen in the chat box, we now have a Facebook page, a Twitter handle, as well as a LinkedIn page as well. Excellent. Thank you both so much. It was a great honor to, to moderate this. Uh, I think this is a really momentous occasion launching on this project. So thank you for all of your work. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for tuning in. You're all part of it too, as was just said. So uh, Join see us. you in <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wait, I want to mention one thing. Oh, is yeah. it too late? No, say your <laughs> <laughs> We're going to host a town hall. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. On May 8th. So we're going to continue the conversation 
on May 8th. I can't believe we, we didn't mention that yet. Um, and so, yeah, that's our that's our opportunity to really, you know, continue what we started here with you all. Thanks. Take it in and bring those comments there. More info to be announced. Uh, thank you all. And see you in half an hour. We've got Marisa and Troy on community building coming up at uh, 4.10. All right.